Who's this for? For three sides of the coin. Those fucking idiots. Come on. <laughs> Get real. <laughs> this week, three sides of the coin, our special guest shares a story about how his mom almost killed Paul Stanley. It was news to us. Not good. And he Not was, good. And, 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 and he was managed by Bill O'Coin in, in the 80s. His band was managed by Bill O'Coin. We're joined this week by Johnny Gioelli from Hardline. Some amazing Don't miss stories. this one. No, this is some cool stories Tell for you. sure. This is Three Sides of the Coin. Talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. We're the original two, the two that matter, the two that make this, the success that it is. My why grand old Tommy Summers. That, why don't you just come right out and say Mark quit? Now we already played that That, But we haven't done before. that in a while. We, you know, we haven't done that in a while. So actually do this, guys. For any of you that can personal message him, personal message him and say, you, you quit? Why would you quit? Because, <laughs> yeah, he's definitely not going to watch this show. No, of course not. He's not on it. By the way, Mark isn't here this week, if you've noticed. He's um, somewhere in Florida eating shrimp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that that's more important than being on three sides of the coin is eating shrimp. Of course. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Text message him, message him on Facebook, whatever, and just say, dude, you quit the show? What happened? Because he gets really, really worked up. It's funny. So let's play with his it's mind. Everything. Instead of us playing with our listeners' minds, you guys which, we do, mess with which we do love, but it's your mm-hmm. turn. You guys mess with Mark. Mm-hmm. Okay, there you Had go. A great guest. Yeah, that that that's your homework for for this week is go out and mess with Mark. Tell him mm-hmm. tell him you miss him. Tell him he's got to start his own show. One one side of my coin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or meatloaf recipes by Mark. That, that actually his own show will never happen because he has no idea how to hit a record button. <laughs> he can barely get online. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, any any comments to read from last week's Ace Fraley track by track? Oh, Lord. There are so many of them. I don't even know where to start. Uh, it's, it's funny how when we were just talking about this before we started taping the show, that how upset some people get whenever we talk about Ace Fraley. And um, it just seems like the Looney Tunes kind of come out of the shadows, you know. Um, what was the name's guy? Uh, what was the guy's Arch, name? Arch, uh, Arch Fraley. Oh, yeah. That's just, that's beautiful. Here, let me pull it up. All right, here we go. Of course, it's freezing on me here. Do you have it in front of you? No, I don't. He basically was okay. just like, why is Mike, why does Mike hate Ace Fraley? Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, he, he obviously doesn't watch the show. Oh, here it is. Why does Michael Brandvold hate Ace? Now, this is under this week's YouTube of the review of the new Ace Fraley record, Spaceman. So you got to make sure that you comment on this post because it's quite a lot of fun. But he just goes on and on about, um, you know, oh, God keeps disappearing on me uh, on on you know why why even bother doing this because you don't like him and da, 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 da. he hasn't even listened to the show hasn't so even to the show. Uh, right but um a lot of uh, positive comments and um i liked uh vincent junio's uh i'll give the episode a three out of five i like that that was good and, 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 and my uh, reply to that was your reply to that was let me see Oh, this comic gets a one out of five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then uh, 65 Doug K says, Tommy, you saw the dead daisies. They opened for Kiss at the Iowa State Fair. True, they did, but I was not present at that moment. So I'm looking forward to seeing them on the cruise. Um, and then I like, these are the ones I love. Kelly uh, Nodwell. 
so nice to see Ace releasing new music. He looks happy. Very cool to see. Have a great day, Three Sides. Thank you. Wow, non-confrontational, non-aggressive. And, and, and listen, I want to do a big shout out to Ace Fraley himself, who actually shared our track by track review episode on his Facebook page and his Twitter account. Yes, he, he did. He he actually. Um, let me see here. What I want to find. Um, what did he exactly say here? That you're uh, a tool. Well, yeah, we know I'm a tool. He said. And these are his words, not ours. You wanted the best Kiss podcast. That's what he wrote. But they, but they were busy. <laughs> yeah, but we're having technical difficulties at the moment, so please settle for three sides. <laughs> exactly. But with some creative editing, I can turn that into Ace Fraley. You wanted the best Kiss podcast, three sides of the coin. Mm-hmm. You can. Just further stir the pot because you are a pot stirrer. Yeah. Yeah. People just hate us. Anyway. Anyway. Um, oh, I do want to take this moment since it comes out in a, I don't know, about a week after this comes out. Oh, yes. Did you get yours? Yes. I have not opened it, though. All right. So this is the new Ace Fraley vinyl lp this is the silver vinyl that's badass it's really badass um let's see what else is in here this is the the sleeve Nice. And let's see. Oh, and it does come with a digital download card as well. Nice little card. Very cool. So that's the vinyl. The CD, for the most part, is pretty much the same, although the insert opens up into a poster, a mini poster. That's cool. Mini poster. And then nice. this is the back side of that. I kind of want to take the vinyl on the on the cruise with me to see if I can get him to sign it because it's just so cool. Yeah, the vinyl looks awesome. I mean, and, and they've got so many variations of it in different colors, too. So definitely get out there. Um, it, it's a great record. Get out there. Support Ace. Yes, purchase this, pre-order it, get the vinyl, the digital, whatever it is that you you enjoy musically, go out and get that format and support Ace Fraley. I mean, come on people. Let's let's help Ace show him that that we want more music by him. Um yes. this week we have a special guest joining us. Uh let's just he was managed by Bill Coin. His mother almost killed Paul Stanley. Paul Stanley. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was in a band with the guitarist from Journey. I think you can figure out who that is. Do, 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 Gioelli from Hardline sits down with us. I thought you were supposed to say Gioelli. Gioelli. Um, dude, it's a great conversation. Don't 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 sit here and go, what what's Hardline got to do with it? Do, trust me, amazing freaking stories about mm -hmm. about Bill Coin managing them, uh, then going on and forming Hardline with Neil and being managed by Herbie Herbert. And how those are different managers. Um, his mom chasing Paul Stanley, nearly killing Paul. Some amazing yeah. freaking stories here. And just great, great I'm stories sorry. about Journey and Steve Perry and Neil Sean and, and the music industry and getting dropped and the advent of grunge and what did that do. This is really a fun interview. So let it, it roll. 
Johnny from Hardline joins us this week. Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Hey, Three Sides of the Coin listeners. We want to welcome this week's special guest, Johnny Gioelli. I got it. I got it. Woo, man! It was easier that was, that when you was like a. I was gonna say it was easier when you said like your name pump. was Steve Perry. <laughs> <laughs> man, you said that like it was a beautiful pasta dish. Gioelli. <laughs> Gioelli. Give, give me a little yeah. little Parmesan Perfect, on the top of that too. Um, always, and, 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 always, and par- always and Parmesan that. that does not come out of the green container, right? That is correct. <laughs> actually, we use locatelli, locatelli cheese, and you always use a grater. Are you kidding? That's the real Italian way. You got to grate the stuff. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, Johnny, let's let me give you the opportunity to give the two minute who you are, what you've done. And 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 why you're talking to a bunch of Kiss geeks? Oh, awesome, man! Okay, so who am I? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> uh, no kidding. So so I have uh, I've been a professional musician actually since I'm 11 years old. People don't realize that. And the definition of professional means you get paid. Isn't that interesting? Exactly. So at 11 years old, I st- I started making music and um came up through the ranks i'm now uh, my god 40 years 39 years to be exact uh in this wonderful business we call music i've made now gosh uh last i checked well over 50 albums uh, released worldwide uh my my sort of my claim to fame is my double eclipse hardline album which also featured neil sean from journey and we made a, a, a wonderfully classic you know, rock album um, that's still very well known today. And I still tour with Hardline uh, today. As a matter of fact, I'm heading out to Bulgaria this week. And, uh, and then I'm on tour until Christmas time. As a matter of fact, Europe, Eastern Europe, all over the place. So my, um, I, so my, my main band is, of course, Hardline. That's my, my brainchild, my baby. And I still nurture it, and and I breastfeed it today. Of course, it starves when I breastfeed it. But uh, <laughs> so that that's happening today. I'm also the singer for a sort of metal group called Axel Rudy Pell. A lot yep. of my fans know who yep. uh, ARP is. That's 21 years in the making, and I can't even tell you how many albums there. Wow. And then my other passion and love in music is uh crush 40 and crush 40 is a group of two guys myself and june sonoi who resides in japan and we write uh cool rock music for all the sega games i should say all of them for a lot of the sonic the hedgehog games and we have a massive fan following and they're just great kids and adults and people who just like fun rock game music and um those are my three main projects, we'll call them, or my, my three main uh, loves. But, um, you know, the reason I'm connecting with you guys, which is uh, a pleasure and an honor, thanks, guys, uh, is uh, you know, my, my coming up in this music business was, was very interesting. I was guided by a guy that I'm sure you know uh, by the name of Bill LaCoyne, who was uh, yep. managing KISS, and uh, learned so so much from this guy. So, so much. So, so let me, so let, 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 you, let me yeah. see if I know where that comes in. And, 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 and if I get this wrong, I'm going to be skewered by your fans and KISS fans. But prior to Hardline, <laughs> you were managed by Bill Coin in a band called Brunette. That is 100% correct. And, uh, that band, that band was uh, was endorsed by shampoo companies and had over 17 feet of hair, and uh, yes, and had just tremendously lousy music. But I was just I was learning, you know. I was I was still new to songwriting now, and just trying to hone the skill. Well, didn't you guys start out as blonde 
and then you changed the name when you realized everyone was brunette? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Actually, you know what's funny? Is we, it's funny thing about it is we did have a blonde guitar player that we just begged this guy. We brought him in, and he, he, he said he would absolutely dye his hair to be brunette. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you have to, otherwise it just doesn't work. And uh, he never did. He chickened out. So it was just like brunette and one stupid blonde guy. It just didn't work. Now, correct me if I'm wrong again, wasn't your brother in brunette? Yes. Yes, and my brother was also in hardline. He was uh, guitar opposite. He was rhythm player in hardline opposite Neil Sean. So, yeah, brunette was where we really learned with with guidance from from bill and kenny kerner who who uh also uh, passed away who was um buds with bill and um you know his creativity of course with 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 kiss i mean come on it's it's insane off the charts so we really used bill as a as a gauge for trying to be different and uh he did take us down some some paths that were really uh he really uh, we were an unsigned band that sold out every single show in the planet we had more fans more fan mail more everything because he knew how to market he knew exactly how to market the band yeah you know i you know i grew up and loved the 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 80s rock era whether you want to call it hair metal or just metal or rock whatever but you know, growing up in the age of Metal Edge magazine and and KNAC and and every other magazine that was out there covering the scene, um, you guys were everywhere. You saw Poison, Motley Crue, Warrant. There was there was Brunette. The thing was, they were all signed and you weren't. Yes, and that is still odd to me but looking back the songs i have to be honest man the songs just weren't there we only we only had a few songs that would have really been there you know i mean we weren't ready honestly i can say that honestly i as a songwriter because i wrote all that brunette stuff i wasn't ready yet bro and i and i didn't uh even bill you know bill would point out things because he was so creative and had such a consumer eye he would say your 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 parents your pants they're, they're too high you have to make them more short-waisted i'm like what what are you talking about <laughs> man my pants fit fine no they're too high i mean just crazy shit like that he would see and we just didn't have the eye for it although he believed in the music um it just it was just weird weird it was just weird it was, it was almost like the industry knew that there was going to be this change and when guns and roses came in that there was going to be like this change and we weren't, we didn't fit that profile. So I don't know why we didn't get signed. I mean, we sell out places like, like the Roxy in 15 minutes, you know, back in the day in the sunset strip, like literally it was like a, they'd put the big spotlights and the whole deal when well, we, when we did a show. Let, extravaganza. Let, let me ask you, I mean, obviously, um, you know, you had Bill of coin and, uh, before Bill, or maybe it was in the same, same time frame, Was it, Deborah Rosner. Did so she... Deb worked. She was a PR girl, so she worked closely with one involved to sort of um, pimp us out. Sure. Any way she so, so, so could. you 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 basically had um, some very experienced, well-known people in your corner, and like I said, you guys were you were everywhere. You were you were people were reading about you, hearing about you everywhere. And I got to assume you did your fair share of label showcases and you did demos for labels. What what was what kind of feedback were you hearing from the label? Because back in that time frame, it, it seemed like, you know, once Poison got signed and once Motley Crue got signed and, and all of a sudden the labels seemed to be just like signing anything. It's just like you showed up on Sunset Strip. You looked great you could get some deal with somebody. So what kind of feedback were you getting from the labels? So we were, we were getting the, we're almost there, which just didn't sit well with me. We we're almost at that time. We we're almost there. We actually turned down a deal from Gene, from Gene Simmons when he had his label. We actually turned that deal down um, 
basically because we would have had to uh, give up all our wives and children and cars and uh, and and the homes. It wasn't a good deal. Well, you know, and, and, and let, let me explore that a little bit because I wasn't aware of that. But sure. I have heard that, you know, like with House of Lords and other bands, he basically had them sign over their names and everything to 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 Gene. So Gene basically owned everything. Is that is that the gist of the type of deal he had offered you? That is that's exactly right. And and you know, we might have been dumb back there, then, but uh, we we weren't that dumb. And uh, and at the time, Capitol Records, you know, they were looking at us and we were working, even working with some outside songwriters like Mark Tanner, who wrote, you know, like the Nelson stuff. And he wrote a lot of Aerosmith tunes for like the movie Armageddon. He worked with those guys to write those songs. So we were working with I was working with outside writers and ready to cultivate this deal on Capitol. And then the person who was going to sign us left the company, oh, which God. is just such a typical, just, typical story. Isn't, uh, isn't that the rock and yeah, roll story? I mean, well, well, what about but when, you're, when you're saying that you weren't quite ready? Let me ask you this then. From your perspective now, many years later, and, and all of the songs that you've written and all the stuff you've been involved in, what do you see that was missing then through your eyes now? Well, I think it was seriously the songwriting that sort of that sort of 80s hit kind of, you know, every rose has its thorn kind of melody thing. I was just a little bit more outside of that and yeah, wrote a little bit crappy. more creatively. Well, there's some pretty crappy bands that got signed in that era. So that's the part that I'm having, I struggle with a little bit because it's like, how bad could it have been if you're selling out the rock scene? You're, you know, granted it's promotion, but Jesus, some of those yeah. bands, like to Michael's point, it seemed like once Poison got signed, that opened up the freaking floodgates for pretty much anybody to get signed. It's true, man. I, I, again, like I said, I'm still perplexed. Uh, so, I, but the only thing I can really do is blame myself really at this point. Uh, I'm a pretty humble guy and I'm just, I'm just, I, cause you're right. Selling out publicity everywhere. People knew who we were. So it could have only been the songs. Uh, they just didn't have enough, you know, star quality in, in the songs. I, I, I and I, I have no understanding why some of those other shit bands got signed, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. but they were brutal. Some of them were brutal. I was like, yeah. Oh my God, this guy can't even sing. They, they can't, they you know, can't even the, sing. You know, they can't sell out shows. All they are is a no. third generation poison. Yeah, there was a lot of that going on for sure. So I have really, I have no answer, no answer why it uh, didn't happen for us. But you know what? Things happen for a reason, and I'm glad it didn't happen. Because shortly after, as you know, I partnered with Neil Sean. And then my career just went from, from zero to 120. And so everything happened for a reason. Back then I was sad about it. I couldn't understand it. We were perplexed. We were pissed. We hated record companies, this, that, and the other. But we just kept you know, moving forward. That's, that's all, we could, all we could do. So it's almost, but in a way it is a blessing because there's so many bands or, or musicians I've seen that came out in that era and they're stuck there, just like people who were on a TV show. They can't escape that character. And it seems like hair metal, for the lack of a better term, has destroyed a lot of careers. Yeah, unless exactly. And it, and it really, it has, if you didn't take the opportunity to sort of, you know, blossom out of that, so to right. speak, you know, just kind of, you know, uh, get out of the denial phase that, okay, look, this this type of music really doesn't exist anymore as far as mainstream and you need to adapt or be okay with where you're at because and that's just the you know the, the reality and a lot of those musicians and god bless them all it's great i'm you know, happy for them all labels like frontiers have saved a lot of those guys lives you know it's, yeah. at least put them back into a you know a, a small circle but at least they're in a circle and not a square before they were not even you know so uh yeah it's it's interesting i do say it's a blessing because it um it forced me to to move on and i, I knew eventually i would 
I would get there. And I mean, I'm, I've had a, a long career. I'm busier now than I have ever been in my entire music career. It's mind blowing. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's phenomenal. I've got my, my solo record, which we can talk about. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah, coming de- out in we, December. We, we, we definitely will. You know, I, I want I want to circle back to, so you you, you had Bill Coin kind of was he officially a manager or was he just kind of yeah. a, okay? So he was managing Brunette. Um, yes. Yes. Was now looking back, do you feel like he was putting too much attention into? the marketing, the image, the promotion, and less into the developing of the artist, the songwriting and all that stuff? Well, that's a, that's a really great question. And, and the short answer is I can recall, I literally can picture him in our Vernon, California um, rehearsal room next to the pig slaughterhouse. So you can imagine the smell in this place. <laughs> we literally, it was horrible. I can, I can literally, I, I'm going to tell you straight out what he said. He said, you guys are 100 times better musicians than Kiss could ever be. He literally said that. And I'm like, whoa, Bill, gee, whoa, man. He goes, no, I'm telling you that. I don't have any worry with your um, music ability that we're going to grow that. I do worry about your, your look, you know, and your, you know, your vibe and your stage presence, all that needs to be worked. That's what he said, bro. Right or wrong. That's what he said. That's that, 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 that's interesting uh, because I, I sort of would, would take that as him going, I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about your music. You've you've nailed it, and exactly. and and he's yep, going to just exactly. focus everything on, you know, making you look like a beautiful band. And you know, and I would, right. you know, again, I'm not, I wasn't there. I'm not in the band. I wasn't in your shoes. But looking back now, I would sit there and go, boy, that might have been a sign of, you know, what the music has to come first. You know, a band's look and yeah. image. And, and listen, I I work in the music industry, and I've been working in it for decades, and I do marketing and promotion. I tell people I went to the, the KISS School of Marketing. That's where I studied. But, you know, the image of a band, a lot of times, is a much easier fix. It really is. You know, if the music isn't there, if the songs weren't there, as you were saying, that's not something that can just get fixed overnight and a budget by going down the street to some you know fashion store and buying some new new threads <laughs> you know if the songs right. aren't there it doesn't matter how beautiful you look how great your ads are how everything is packaged because you know as well as i do at the end of the day it's the music that has to yeah, come first it is that's true yeah. Uh, that's true, but he, yeah, so he had absolutely no concern uh, about the music for him. And I think you know, it's because he was such a creative, obviously outside the box marketing guy. And that was his, that was his, in his wheelhouse to, to control better than the music. As long as he liked what he heard, he was cool with it. And, and so, yeah, we, we he never, ever said, we got to work on that song or we got to, I need to hear more songs. I need to hear more hits. I need to hear more of this. That's interesting. You know, never. It was always your pants are too high. You need to make them tighter. You need to unbutton your buck button. Back in the day, you had to have your pants button open, man, so the chicks could kind of imagine what's going to happen in there. It was crazy times. And uh, it, yeah, it was all it was, visual. It was and all the image for him. They used to, it was all image for him. All, but, all image. Yeah. But do you think it's possible too that because of his success with Kiss, he wanted to just basically keep doing that over and over and over again. It's like, you know, building a business, selling it off, and then starting another business. So that might have been his only angle of how to attack this with any band, whether it be Brunette or any other any other artist. Yes, and, and I will tell you the way we met Bill 
was pretty interesting. We had a day-to-day uh, manager, uh, Kenny Kerner, who, who just recently passed away, yep. rest his soul. And Kenny, Kenny said um, he basically took us under his wing uh, earlier uh, than Bill and said, I want you guys to be managed by Bill LaCoyne. I want you to meet him, and here's how we're going to do it. He made us, and we willingly did it, dress as if we were – getting ready to get on stage. I mean, the makeup, the hair, the freaking the studs, the bullet belts, the shit, you know? And we literally, Bill was in an office and we literally walked in. And we're like, how you doing? Nice to meet you. And he was like, holy shit, who's this? And that's how we met Bill. We literally walked in on him in an office in full garb, like we're getting ready to jump on the stage. So we showed him immediately, this is our image. Look how cool we look. And let's do this. And then he heard the music and then he took us on. So that's how it all happened. So I think it was that, uh, you know, that, that original meeting and him seeing us, what we look like, and then his, his motor just started to run and he just wanted to make adjustments from there. You know, as you know, as, as kids back then, were you guys kind of in like, Holy shit, Bill Coin wants to work with us, manage us. Oh. I mean, were you like, this is it? Our ship has come in? Yes. Yep. Oh, dude, are you kidding me? I mean, who hasn't traced with, with trace paper every one of those freaking albums? I mean, it was, yes. It was like, we're done. We're, we're there now. We are there now. We're with Bill Coin. We're there. So... Did did you have Absolutely. any did you have any other industry people before during or after that coming in and going hey uh, you know talk to us we want to manage you we want to take over your careers Yeah you know we had uh a, a lot of those guys um approach us uh after Bill and um you know basically what happened Joe I'm I'm trying to recall sort of the um the end of it all and it was just simply um when brunette basically broke up it just kind of you know dissolved you know what i mean i knew did did did, uh, did, 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 did the break I, did the breakup yeah. happen because basically you got frustrated with being so big and yet nothing happening uh yes Exactly right. That's exactly what happened. It was just such a frustration between members and uh, some of the brunette guys wanted to they wanted to move out of California. And there was they were, you know, they were just, yeah, pure frustration. And my brother and I looked at each other and said, all right, let's just let's move on here. So we just dissolved the whole thing. We, and then what happened was we decided uh, that we'd like to do sort of like a you know we knew the nelson brothers the nelson twins we said let's do a hard rock version of uh, you know that kind of uh thing that vibe and we called ourselves brothers and we were and the album that was written for hardline was literally the record that my brother and i were making we were making that record so once that music started to be solicited around we had every manager under the sun but we didn't uh, we didn't think it was uh, a project for Bill. So, it so, some, so it was just it was t- it was time for us to move on. If if you and your brother were writing the music that eventually became Hardline, why did that music not materialize in Brunette? Um, it was uh, it was written after. Um, I, I, I wasn't there yet, man. I wasn't musically, it just it was, it wasn't the right time. It just was not my time that happened, uh, after brunette. Um, and I don't know, I got wildly creative and off it went. It was just my time to make that music. It wasn't in brunette. I don't know why, bro. I can't really answer that correctly. Let, you know this this is a big what this is a big what if question but you know looking back now would you re, would you have gone with Bill Coin again if you knew what you knew gosh um i don't think so and i don't and, and i don't mean that I in a way of disrespecting yeah. bill but yeah me neither. You, you know he just it it seems like he just wasn't the absolute perfect 
fit for you guys. Right. Exactly. It, it didn't work. Um, I, I don't discount his abilities. The guy's a freaking genius. Uh, it just did not work for us. So it's like, you know, there comes a point where you have to make adjustments in your career and your life, just like your life. And that's what we did. First thing we did was get rid of the band and then uh, focused on writing songs, just my brother and I. And then, you know, it, it went from there. You know, and what happened uh, with Hardline happened. And we never, so once, the other thing I should point out, very important is, once Neil heard this music, this new music that I wrote, he immediately uh, contacted Herbie Herbert and said, we have to have Herbie Herbert listen to this music. So already it's like, holy shit, okay, <laughs> Bill Coin to Herbie Herbert. I mean, these are the biggest of the big. And we just thought it was appropriate to change everything, man. Sometimes you just have to change everything. Right. And that's right. what we did. Right. So... So you, you, you're moving into Hardline. How does your music get in front of Neil Schoen? So um, it was actually through my sister. So my sister actually married Neil Schoen. They were together about eight years. And every Christmas time, we'd all go back to the East Coast because we're originally from East, the East Coast. I'm actually an East Coaster again. Um, and... At Christmas time, we'd all celebrate Neil as well. And we never leaned on Neil for anything. We didn't even talk about the music business because we just were not like that. We didn't, we didn't want help like that. We wanted to earn it. That's the way the old school Italian work. We cool. work. Yep. We were in the kitchen, and I, was, I had an acoustic, and I was sitting there and I was playing a song called Face the Night, which is on one of the Hardline records. And Neil comes flying in. He goes, let me hear that. I, and I started playing a little bit. He goes, give me the guitar, give me the guitar. And he starts playing these chords. Neil's chord knowledge is off the charts, man. I mean, he's, he's insanely talented. I'm like, holy shit, Neil, that's amazing. He goes, yeah, try this, try that. I said, Neil, would you entertain maybe producing this record? Because I was blown away at how he could take a song and take it to the next level with just chord knowledge, you know, using introducing different chords. So he goes, man, I'm really busy with bad English, but um, if you want, you know, just keep writing. And when I come home from the studio, let me listen to what you have and let me offer some suggestions. I said, okay, fair enough. So he didn't say yes. Yeah. And then what happened, you guys, was he fell absolutely in love with this music. He would come home from the studio and be like, Johnny, man, that freaking kicks ass. Let's try this. And we started laying down stuff. And we had a chemistry. We could finish songs faster than a freaking, you know, whatever. And he then asked if he could join my brother and I and form a band. And it was the farthest thing from our minds. And we literally said no. He said, <laughs> I never forget <laughs> it. I said no. Nice. No, it wasn't the vision, man. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm not, I wouldn't say stubborn. I'm just pretty focused on what I want to do. Um, in, in a good way, not in an asshole way. And he goes, Johnny, I, I can't believe you don't want me in the band. I said, Neil, it's a different thing. We're trying to do this hard rock Nelson thing, this brothers thing. And we'd love for you to produce and, and write with us, but a band, we remember, we just, we just came out of brunette, which broke up. It was just like, you know, you need therapy after one of those breakups It's crazy. <laughs> and to jump into another band, I was like, Oh my God. So we said no, and then we, some time went by, and then my brother and I discussed it. We said, you know what? She's a great guy. We all get along so great. It's different than it was. Let's go for it. And honestly, we knew. I'd be lying to you if I said uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't help our career. Of course it did. It's Neil fucking yeah. Sean. It mm -hmm. helped our career. And um, it put us at a different level, but the songwriting, everything had to be there. You know, like I had to really sing. <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, it was like the real thing. So we said, okay, let's put, let's build a band. And then he goes, man, I got the greatest drummer in the world, Dean Castronovo. And then Dean said, my buddy Todd Jensen, he's out on tour with David Lee Roth right now, but he's hating it. And he'll be the perfect bass player. And we, we auditioned bass players. I mean, everyone under the sun uh, came to audition 
and because they heard this music, you know, we solicited a little bit of the music for the audition and they had to learn the songs. And it was it was mayhem. And then that was the birth of Hardline. I said, OK, here we go again, another band. But, you know, we did it and it's it was it was an awesome experience. I learned so much about the business, about, you know, just, just how everything works. It is really a uh, an amazing day-to-day business i mean back then you know when you had air- airplay we had radio play i used to literally because we didn't have the freaking computers we couldn't right. we can't couldn't analyze our underwear let alone uh, uh you know airplay i used to get a fax from the record company a fax mm-hmm. and i would see all the different rotations okay uh, um knac went from light to medium and i'd use a pin to, and I put it on a map. I said, oh, yep. I would look at it. Yep. Go, okay, look, we got good, got good airplay over here. We have shitty airplay over here. Let's let's do some more promotion here. I learned so much, and most of that I learned from Neil uh, and from you know Herbie. Um, you know, just living that day to day life in the real music business. So, well, I've I've got so uh, so cool many ride. so many questions related to Hardline, but first thing. Can you compare and contrast yeah. Bill Coin and Herbie as managers? So, um, yes. I mean, they're so two legend. They're legendary managers yeah. in their own rights. Yes. So, Bill Coin, all creative, all visual. Herbie Herbert, all musical, and he's a musician himself. Herbie, all music all about the song he wouldn't give a shit if you went up and camouflage freaking underwear play the song sing it sing like the record kick ass doesn't give a shit what you wear that's the contrast right there bill a coin look a certain way have a certain vibe um when you walk out on stage people should freaking melt when they see you just off of your coolness so Kirby. I don't give a shit what you look like. <laughs> well, but so then I got, well, are you still are you still friends or do you still have a, a relationship with Neil? I do. Yes, uh, okay. I text Neil from time to time, especially you know when his mother passed away. Of course. Okay. The course reason we, uh, we chat. The reason I ask is that I would love some insight because this is just out of sheer curiosity. It seems like things have been very odd in the journey camp over the last year from things that have been said in the press, you know, Mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, knowing him like you do, what leads to that kind of distress uh, between members? It seems like he's come out and said a couple of things on some of the different uh, websites about very specific issues within an article even. And I, you know, for years, I don't ever remember hearing anything from him in any band he was in, uh, regardless. And now it seems like he's become a lot more vocal about journey specific. What, what do you think has changed with him or has he just become more vocal? Um, yeah, I think he's, you know, there's, there's one thing that can ruin a band and that's a really nice pair of legs. So I think there's some, yeah. I, okay. That can ruin more than just a band. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, no, that says everything remember, that you said at all. Yeah. Remember what, what, uh, what Rocky, Rocky Balboa's trainer told him, women, they're weak in your, they're weak in your legs, Rocky, they're weak in your legs. Anyway, uh, I, I think it kind of started there. And um, it, this is just my own you know, Great. and I'm not an opinion. Please don't, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not digging for dirt, and we don't do a TMZ show. Sure. I just was curious right. <laughs> because I, as as a casual fan of Journey and looking from the outside in, when you when I start to see it, relatively often the alarm bells start to go off a little bit, and it just it's curious to me after working together for so many years how things can kind of go awry. Yeah, I think it's 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 probably a, a you know, just a, a culmination of a whole bunch of stuff. You know, um, you know, relationships. You, you think about it. You know, if you if you're married and how difficult just marriage is with one person, you're basically in a band, man. You're married to everyone there. Their yeah. habits, the smell of their their asses, the gas they pass. Everything is every day with with uh, with a band. 
and um, it can be very difficult at times. And I think with Neil, Neil, he was very patient musically, but with everything else, not so patient. You know what I mean? So he would just be very quick to move on if something bothered him. And so I, I, I'm probably thinking that he's just frustrated internally in the band and just wants to move on and you know i think that's probably it with 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 neil in hardline was you know and i this is only asking you what your perception was was it an adjustment for him because obviously you know he's coming from journey which you know had huge huge and then even bad english did phenomenally well and now he's in Hardline, which is a band that's basically starting from nothing. That did he have a hard time kind of going back to that and you know busting his chops to get back up to the top again, or did he get into Hardline? And he's like, no, you know, I want to be treated like I'm Neil and Journey. You know, I want, I want, you know, all of the the lavish stuff that goes with being in journey even though he's not in journey anymore no here's the great thing with with neil he would play any club bar venue anything just to play this hardline music he didn't expect to be treated any differently than than us he was so awesome that way awesome didn't matter. I mean, I remember we played this place in Arizona. It was called like the bookstore, or book club. And I walked in this place and it was like this little tiny little place. And there were like 7 billion books all over the place. I'm like, where the hell are we? It was like playing a Starbucks. And you know what? We put on, he didn't care. Never once did he ever complain. Like, man, I'm freaking Neil Sean from Journey, man. What the, never. I always do the voice. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, That's awesome. but no, never. <laughs> hey, hey, man, Johnny, man, check out this shit. This little place. No, never, 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 never. He just cared about playing. That's what, that's what he knows, man. He is an amazing talent, and touring with him was so easy. It was easy. He was always, you know, like on time and like ready to play. And that guy never stopped playing a freaking guitar. He was a pro. Yeah, he was a pro. That was his life. That's his life. So, 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 what so, so back to Herbie versus Bill. After coming out of working with Bill, and now you've been introduced to Herbie, were you immediately going, oh, my God, this, this is the manager we need. This is, what, this is what was missing when it was just Bill a coin. Because to your point about Herbie, it's like it's all about the music. Man, you go back and look at early Journey, even Journey when, you know, Escape came out. There was a band that, Okay, there were some good looks there, but they sure didn't have a concise, clean image. You know, it's like, you know, Steve Perry's running around in tennis shoes and a tuxedo jacket. And, <laughs> you know, it, right, it was like it was go. like yeah. everybody in the band was doing their own thing. It worked, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't Kiss. It wasn't a Poison. It wasn't where some band who was like, okay, we've got to think about the pants each of us wear and the belts and the shoes and, you know, is it the top button have to be, you know, as you were talking about, none of that seemed to matter to right. Herbie and Journey. And, exactly. and and what did we get out of Journey? Amazing songs. And what came out of that first Hardline album? An album of amazing music that, you know, did you look back and go, yeah, that's exactly the change we had to have? Yeah, I did. I did 100%. And, and I'm telling you, you know, it was hard for us because we had to, back in that, those brunette days with Bill, we had to force ourselves to try to be and to look like something. I mean, we felt, you know, forced. I mean, we were going up against a guy who, you know, freaking created Kiss, for God's sakes. We, it was a lot of pressure on us. So this also uh, took that pressure off. It didn't matter what we wore. And um, well, so, that, that, that's that's interesting yeah. to hear. So are you basically saying like back in the brunette days, what you were doing wasn't natural? It was more of this. We're doing this because we think this is what we're supposed to be doing. That's exactly right, bro. It's exactly right. It was the times. 
and it was also the pressure of trying to look all friggin you know beautiful and haired out when really we could give two shits we just wanted to we just wanted to play but um that's what you had to do and it was a lot of pressure in that so with with herbie um and neil you know that was that weight was immediately lifted neil had short hair we had long yep. hair so we knew there wasn't going to be any you know any synergy between hair follicles so we knew that this is was the right place for us it was going to be focused on music and that's all we did you know even in between you know after the hardline double eclipse record and we were preparing for the next one we had a live record and stuff like that neil and i wrote every single day when my house was being built um my wife and i actually moved in uh with with neil and my sister our house was being built and we wrote every single freaking day we would just sit down and write it was all about the music the music the music the music but is do you think in your in your opinion now looking back or or i should say music as a whole now is music enough because it it seems to me that the look is so important to so many people that without it, you don't get heard. And maybe that's I'm an oversimplification, but it just, especially now, even more so with the internet, it, it seems like you got to have a combination of both. Yeah. The music's got to be there first, but I don't know, bro. I, I, I don't, I don't agree. Have you taken a look at a picture of Ed Sheeran? Holy God. Sure. Give me a break. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> doesn't that's matter. True. But I guess, really, I guess his matter. look to me, his look matches the music I would expect him to produce. You think so? Just, okay, maybe. maybe yeah, so, but it was, certainly wasn't certainly look, wasn't his look. It wasn't his look that catapulted him. That's for sure. No, but he's kind of. Don't you think he's a little bit of an anomaly? Like I'll give you a perfect yeah, example true. of <laughs> what I mean. Take Blackberry Smoke. Are you familiar with them? No. Oh, should okay. I be? Yeah. Uh, I, I I think those guys can write songs like Nobody's Business. They're kind of, a, I guess, if you had to, a mix between the Allman Brothers and um, Leonard Skinner. It's like a southern rock. They're from uh, the south and just beautiful, melodic songs. And they don't have much of a look. And I, I sit there and I watch them in amazement at how good they are musically. I see them whenever I can, but can't quite figure out why everyone else hasn't figured it out yet. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, um, I... Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know, but I, I, I'm pretty adamant about the fact that uh, the look shouldn't have anything to do with anything. Well, it's, exactly. it's all about the music and the vibe. Trick. Yeah, look at Cheap Trick, you know. Incredible right. songwriters, and, you know. Not the prettiest yeah, they... band. Half of it's not yeah, pretty. No. Not the prettiest <laughs> Yeah, not the prettiest fellows around, yeah. Yeah. But true, true. It's wild, man. I mean, it's just wild how things have developed and then changed and morphed, and it's it's insane. It's so, insane, so, but so, I love it. I so, love every bit of this business. Back, back to Hardline, you know, once you, you and your brother decided, yeah, we're going to do a band with Neil, did you pretty much in the back of your head go, that's it, we're definitely getting a record deal now? Um, no, it wasn't quite at that point. It was with, once we contacted, once we sold Herbie, we still had to sell Herbie with the music. Once Herbie Herbert heard the music and he took us on, that's when Neil assured us, he would say, man, just relax. Let Herbie do his job, man. We're going to get a killer deal, man. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> and he was right. I mean, <laughs> he's like man i'm telling you man johnny man just relax he knows i make fun of the way he sounds that's awesome but anyway uh he yeah and and we did and we started getting a little nervous and neil kept saying just relax it's gonna happen man and we had one of the largest deals for a new band in a very 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 long time it was you know it was an eight million dollar record deal well i uh, i, I remember i remember when then. when when it was basically announced it was you know it was basically played up as this is kind of a, a new super group that that's being put together here yes um it's true you know there there was i wouldn't i mean maybe you would but there seemed was there a lot of pressure 
all of a sudden that you guys had to live up to this new super group? I mean, hey, Neil from Journey's in this band. It's got to be fucking phenomenal. You you can't have no, anything. Bro. No, uh, no pressure at all. I got to be honest with you. I was in my young 20s and all I thought about was getting this music out there. I didn't think about like I wasn't nervous performing with Neil or writing with Neil or I mean, my, my very first show was the Palace of Auburn Hills in, De- in Detroit with with Van Halen. My first show as an international artist. And I couldn't wait to get on that stage. I couldn't wait So, no, I was, I didn't think about, and, and, you know, and here's the other thing too, and and this still rings true today. I make music first. So a real artist, which I I hope I am, makes music for himself first. It hopes that people will love it and appreciate it. Some do, great. Some don't. Okay, great also. I never once thought about the money. And, And I will tell you that when the deal was over, um, and our a and guy moved on and they dropped us from the label. I did not worry about one penny. My fear, my biggest fear, I had two fears. One, that people would forget who I am. And two, that I would not be able to hear the roar of that crowd when the lights went off. I did not for one second worry about the money or anything like that. So for us, you know, back then in our young 20s, um, it was uh, it was about making the music and making sure the music was heard. That was it. I didn't worry about anything else. So you know, hard hardline is announced. You got Neil in the band. You're managed by Herbie. You've got a record deal. Um, what happened? <laughs> I guess that's the, what happened. <laughs> that that first album, you know. Is a classic album. I still listen to it. I mean, you, you know, there's just Thank you, there's man. just so many great songs on it. You know, hot hot cherry. I mean, you can still hear that yeah. a lot of places. But I got to tell you, just as a quick aside, as a kid who was a Kiss fan, I was even more excited because, dude, you had a song called Doctor Love. Doctor Love. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my, you know what? And Jerry I had no. Car- and listen, I had no idea as a kid back then. I had no idea you were you were managed by Bill Coin. So I was just like, yep. "Holy crap!" You know, I I like the music already for Hardline, but these guys are even cooler. There's a song called Doctor Love. Not too many people do that. Yeah, that is all true, and I love the title equally, man. Believe me. Did was was yeah, was, was that you know, a, was that a little bit of your 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 paying respect to uh, to Kiss and to Bill? Um, actually, no, it, it it wasn't. But I love the title for that very fact. That's fantastic. You know, um, yeah, it just sort of happened, and you know, we went with it, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and and of course, you know, Kiss is responsible. Really, Kiss was responsible for so many people's uh, careers. If my brother didn't go to that that concert in 76, he would have never started his little high school band. And if I didn't see that high school band play and saw my brother play and said, shit, I want to do that, I wouldn't be here today. I mean, I am grateful uh, to every single Kiss record. Man, what they, what they built and how they did it and – just the, the mystery behind it all. Now, you know, the thing that sucks with social media today is we've lost that whole feeling of like when I'll tell you some funny kiss stories. Cause my, my mother almost killed Paul Stanley by accident. That would have nice. been terrible press. Really? Yeah. So I'll tell you that, but yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. So, so yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll first say that, um, you know, we, we, we 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 are missing that mystery yeah. of like I wonder where Kiss is recording, I wonder where they are, I wonder where they live. Now with social media, everyone knows I live on the East Coast. They know I'm here. They go, they see, you know, you got you got to announce. You, you know, I had a, a nice bowel movement last. It was firm. It wasn't too. I mean, it's insane. Well, you, 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 know, you, you know, shit. you know, back back to what you're saying about recording. I mean, come on, as as kids. Who didn't think back then in the seventies, a Kiss obviously Kiss was recording all their music in costume and makeup. 
I mean, it didn't dawn on me for a second that they weren't in character as they recorded God of Thunder. Right. I mean, that's just God of that's what we assume. Sorry, I had to do it. You know, and then all of a yeah, sudden exactly. you see you see pictures of them out of makeup recording an album, and you're like, well, that's still very cool to see, but you're like, oh, wait a second, they're not in makeup. Yeah. It's wild. Remember, I remember not believing that it was them. Like, wait a minute, that's, wait, that can't be him. Does it kind of looks like the shape of Paul Stanley's face, but not really, because you just, you just saw them in makeup. You didn't see them any other way. You couldn't even visualize them. And that's, that's lost. That's lost today. Today, it's just like, you know, you pull down your pants. Here's my balls. Take a good look. There they are. (laughs) There's no mystery. There's no mystery anymore. We need the mystery. But, you know, here's a, here's a funny kiss story. So my parents, God love them. My, my father just passed away a year ago. I miss him dearly. My mother's still alive. God bless her. My mother was our manager. This is going back when I'm now uh, six, 15, 16, 17 years old. And we were massive KISS fans. We would literally hang out at the KISS offices in New York with my mom, God bless her. When Paul Stanley would come out of a recording studio to go change guitars from Sam Ash or something because he would borrow guitars – she chased his ass down with a demo tape of her boys, like, and he tripped, and he almost ate shit. And she, <laughs> yeah, it was very, very close. He took the demo, and actually he called my house. He liked the music. He was getting into production. Can you imagine, man, I'm a, I'm a young teenager, and Paul Stanley calls my house. Here's a great story. Here's a great story. So, yeah, my mother nearly killed him, but he did – take the package he then later calls and you know i uh, i don't advocate this but i i i quit high school at the end of my junior year with my parents my my catholic italian orthodox parents with their blessing because i was so i knew what i wanted to do since i was eight years old i started writing music started playing at eight my friends were playing with tonka toys i was in the studio i was playing i was writing i was working and so it was just the weird, I was just a weird kid. And Paul Stanley called my house and said, I really like what you're doing. I'm getting into production. Do you remember this time we started producing bands and stuff, getting yes. Yep. So I want to, I want to consider some of your music. And I said, Oh my God, you know, thank you so much. And, uh, I told my mom, I got off the phone and said, that was Paul Stanley, mom from kiss. Paul Stanley just called the house, mom. I'm not going to school this week. This was in 11th grade. She goes, okay, I understand. I said, I'm going to work in the, working in the studio. So I'll tell you, it's a funny story. So the principals at my school in the East Coast, I'm not going to mention their name, assholes, but uh, they didn't understand. They didn't understand what I was doing. They didn't understand where my head was at. I had a very clear focus on what I wanted to do with my life. And so they told me, because I was always in the newspaper and stuff, oh, Johnny's doing this, Johnny's doing that, whatever, small town thing. And they said, don't lie. The principal said, don't lie to us. You know, how many stomach aches can you have in a month? How many sinus infections? Because my mom would say, what excuse? I go, I don't know, mom. I got a sinus infection. So they said, just tell us the truth, because we understand what you do. Tell us the truth. So I worked for a week in the studio, missed school, writing new songs for Paul Stanley, God love him. And my mom, it came time for my mom to go back to school. She said, Johnny, what do you want me to write on the excuse? I said, Mom, the principal said write the truth. So my mom wrote, this is a little, this is a little country to Amish country in Pennsylvania, okay, Lancaster, Pennsylvania with the Amish, yep. right? Yep. She writes, she writes, dear Mr. Burp. I won't give the name. Um, Paul Stanley from Kiss called the house, and she writes this all out and wanted to hear more of Johnny's music. Yeah, that went over like a fart in church. It did not go over well. First period, first period, I was immediately called down to the principal's office, and this guy actually shoved me. He shoved me against uh, a locker and said, you know, you need an education, and you do. Don't get me wrong. You do need an education. So I'm not promoting quitting school, kids. Anyone who's listening that's in school, it just wasn't school. just wasn't quite for me. And after that happened, I went home. And I said, Ma, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this anymore. I'll go get my, my GED. I'll, I'll, I'll graduate from high school. I'll pass the test, and I'm moving on with my career. 
And my senior year, my mom woke me up and said, Johnny, it's t- time to get ready for school. And I said, Ma, not going. She goes, go back to bed, son. And that was it. And from that point, um, it's been just full speed ahead. I mean, I am, again, I am busy like a one-leg kickboxer. Could you picture that? Just that one leg. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the career. But, yeah, Paul Stanley called the house, and he actually – was the one sort of responsible for me taking a much more serious approach to music. I literally left school to do nothing but sit in the studio. My brother, God bless him, he worked all the shit jobs, you know, to, you know any, any job he could get, you know, restaurants and washing dishes. And he would come home and he would split half his money with me. He would say, here you go, Johnny, here's half my money I made this week, stay in the studio and write because you have a talent, you've got a gift, stay wow. and write. And I, and God bless him. So when the first Hardline record came out, I returned the favor and gave him half of everything uh, at a much bigger level back to my brother. So That's it's awesome. just a cool a story. Yeah, it's a cool, have cool you, story. Have you talked to Paul about this ever since? No. Can you give me his number? Here, I'll write it down. No, I'm kidding. No, I, I haven't. I did see him at a few shows, you know, when, when Hardline was on tour and we were in England, we, we hung out at a show. Uh, but I, I, I never, I never had, you know, look, they're getting ready for, to do a show. And the last thing I wanted to do was go up to him and break his balls Understood. about, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? So I just respect the privacy, but I would love to tell him uh, that, that, uh, that happened. He really, he literally set the course for, um, you know, finalizing that I'm going to be a professional rock musician. This is going to be my life. Right. And uh, that incident caused it. So it's, it's just cool. It's just, cool. I would think that he would be very interested to know this. You know what I mean? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe so. Because it's, it's a great story, man. What, what a wonderful so. story to what, have what, that kind of a, what jo- yeah. Johnny, what happened to the music that you wrote for Paul? What, what, what happened? What, like what, hap- what happened with that relationship? <laughs> That, it, nothing really transpired from it, honestly. Uh, I never got a, a call back uh, from from him again, and I don't know, it just kind of uh, went away. But it didn't discourage me at all. I just, I, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I just kept moving forward. And then I got a call in the middle of the night from Lita Ford, because I was like this little 11-year-old drummer kid and i i sang behind the drums i had i had a 14 piece ludwig kit and i did these solos where i'm like spitting blood and doing the whole thing and she <laughs> called me in the middle of the night to see if i would audition and that was weird and and uh that never transpired to anything either uh she said she'd call me back she never did lita give me a call for god's sakes i still want the job no i don't want the job <laughs> did, did you but, ever uh, yeah did... no with paul i was gonna say did you ever share oh, your paul ahead, stanley go. story with bill coin no, oddly enough, I never did. Shame on me. Never did. Did you share never it with did. Neil? Yes, yes, with Neil, absolutely. Yeah, Neil. Neil knows the, my whole, you know, coming up in this in this thing. Okay, so let me so, ask. You, I'm always yeah. curious about this type of thing when you talk about someone like a Neil Schoen who gets to that level, and he was somewhat of a peer of Kiss because he was in Santana and did all that. What was his views as a musician on Kiss? He never shared them with me. So the cool thing about Neil is that he could find an appreciation. If in the, even if it's music he didn't like, he could still appreciate the creativity within that song. It may not be a song that he likes. He's like, oh, man, that, that, that sucks, man. But I like that one part where he switches from the E minor to the H. You know what I mean? He would do something. He'd say something like that. But he, so he, yeah, he always found and appreciated the creativity within any kind of music. I never, ever heard him, you know, cut up any band. Um, Although, wait, there was one band, the singer for uh, Lynch Mob. This is, we're going, we're going 26 years ago. And I don't remember who it was, but Neil had a little bit too much to drink and we were at a club and that singer was there and he walked up to that singer and he goes, man, 
Johnny kicks your fucking ass, man. That's all it says. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you hear. <laughs> That's Wait till funny, you hear though. Johnny sing, man. He kicks your ass. I'm like, Neil, 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 Neil. I don't, I don't kick anyone's ass, man. Neil, come on, let's go, man. <laughs> I'll never forget that. He kicks That's your funny, ass, man. <laughs> He's just stepping up, sticking up for his boy, you know. So, yeah. so, so let, let so guys, you know, go, go ahead, I just Johnny. To tell you guys, so. Yeah, I just want to tell you, so, you know, the, the whole pinnacle change, you know, I know you know guys like John Kalodner, this, this, you know, these are massive people yeah. in the industry. What was so bizarre is, you know, a lot of these guys had such great insight to what was going to happen. I'll never forget, John Kalodner told me, he goes, MTV is going away, your videos are not going to be played, forget about it, it's over for you. Just like that. And I'm like, John, what are you talking about? When, man? when, when, when was he? When did he tell you that? What year? Do you remember? So this was, oh, I'll tell you exactly what year it was. It was 1991. Yep. Okay. 1991. I'm recording the record. He goes, check this thing out. It's this band called Pearl Jam, and we listened to it. I said, oh, what the hell? What the hell is that? <laughs> and he goes, this is going to be. This is going to be massive. And he said, look, MTV, all changing you're not going to see a video it's going to be shows and shit i'm like what are you talking about we chose not to believe him stupid us we chose not to believe him and whoa man it all changed it changed fast and the walls came crumbling yeah, but, down but 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 but, wow. but 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 johnny if you were to believe him what would you have done differently Nothing. sung like pearl jam <laughs> yeah. no I just resigned myself to the fact that it may not be as big as I wanted it to be. Exa exactly. It. I got to imagine you were like, well, great. Maybe it is going to change, but we're still recording the album we want and we love, and, and this is us. And we did. And we did just that. But it was pretty eye-opening to, um, you know, to, <laughs> to learn that. I'm just kind of giving you the whole uh, you know, course of events that happened leading up to today. And that was pretty wild, man. It was wild, for, even for Neil. Neil's like, man, that shit's pretty interesting. He never said, Pearl, oh, man, Pearl Jam shit sucks. He just said, man, that's pretty interesting. Okay, man, let's go hit record. Let's go. That was it. You know, like a flash. Let, let, let's move yeah, on. Because, because you know, you know that, that, that change in music style, the, you know, the, the, the advent of grunge, basically, not only yeah. destroyed it for any, quote, hair band, but any rock band, classic rock yeah. band. I mean, the yeah. Journeys of the World, the Kisses of the World, the Aerosmiths of the World, ACDCs, it freaking just chewed up and spit out every band that wasn't wasn't singing like Pearl Jam. You were you you right. were over overnight. You basically yeah. went from playing arenas to you're not getting a return phone call from your record label. Yeah, right, man. Right, exactly right. So is 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 that what ha is that what happened to Hardline after the first album came out? Great first album. And then it just seemed like Hardline just kind of, poof, kind of just yeah. disappeared. Well, yes. Yeah, so we had a meeting. So uh, typical classic, you hear this all the time, textbook, our A&R guy, Paul Atkinson, left. Uh, it was MCA at the time. He left. And the reason we went with MCA is because they were all Sony guys and Neil knew them all. And so did Herbie. So he thought, well, this is great. So you, 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 still, you, still we went with the, you still went with Musician Cemetery of America. <laughs> yes, only because <laughs> only because it was really Sony on the inside. It was right, the same right. guys that worked right. all the you know, worked, uh, journey stuff. So we went to a meeting. So our A&R guy leaves. We went to uh, a meeting where our new A&R guy was there. And he he believed in us his, his name was ron oberman and he's he's a great guy he believed in us but he wanted us to be produced by you know we're going to believe this the pearl jam uh producer i didn't even know who the pearl jam pearl jam producers were i think it was two guys i don't know but anyway neil flipped out because neil produced our hardline record did a great job also yeah. right but he was not willing 
uh, at the time I thought it was wrong, but now I really understand where Neil was going. He was just, he just didn't, he wanted to do and be who we were. And I was just nervous about existing. Right. So Neil freaked out on this new A&R guy. I laugh about it now. And as we were walking out, we had a day-to-day manager, Bill Thompson, great guy. He used to manage Jefferson Airplane. So way Uh back then, he was a real 60s cool. He wore like little pink sunglasses and stuff. He was a trippy guy. And I literally said to Bill on the way to the car, we were in the parking garage at at, uh, MCA at Universal, and I said, we're gone. He was on. Oh, don't don't worry. Everything will be fine. I get a phone call the next day. Uh, Johnny, we're off the label, like that. And I'll never forget a wise man, David Lee Roth, said, "Here today, gone tomorrow afternoon." Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, it's just gone, gone. So look, look, look gone. looking so, back at that that meeting with the new A and R guy, was he setting it up to? Um, make you guys sound like grunge, which so many of those bands from the 80s tried to do with an album or two. It's like, okay, we're going to wear a flannel shirt. I'm going to wear combat boots. And, you know, the music's not going to be quite as happy. Is that, do you think that's where he was trying to get you guys to go? That's exactly what he was trying to do for, for two reasons. One, that he knew that we could do it musically but we didn't want to do it so i'm grateful at the time i was pissed i remember throwing a phone across the room when i was talking to neil i was so pissed because he got so angry at the guy um but now i understand why neil neil was standing up for what you guys are not 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 caving into a record label and, right, and, and, and when and, you're 24, 25 years old you don't get that but well i get it yeah exactly and and and, and i'm sure neil has had those sorts of conversations, not necessarily many times, but in his career, he's probably had record labels sitting down with Journey and Bad English and going, well, you know, this is what you need to do on your next album. And, you know, he's probably had the experience of caving to the record label and then ending up with an album that nobody likes. And he has to live with it the rest of his life. I respect yeah, I mean, today I respect that that outburst. I didn't get it back then, but he was 100% right. I was a young, scared kid. Like, oh, my God, what are we doing? I'm going to have a record deal. No one's going to know who I am. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. You just Everything goes through your head. Uh, and um, so, yeah, that's exactly uh, what it was. And, you know, Neil, I have just so much respect for. He, you know, he's still today. He sticks to those principles. He does what he wants to do, what he believes and what he feels with no regard to what's going on out there uh, on the airwaves, which we're all confused. What the hell is going on out there? I don't know what's in today. I don't know. I just do what I do. But, exactly. Uh, so exactly. I, I've learned. So, 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 yeah. hard, so Hardline gets dropped. Does Hardline basically just break up? Does Neil go, well, I'm going to go off and do something else? What, what happens to the band? Yeah, I mean, when you have Ferrari payments and stuff, man, you got to get some work. So yeah, <laughs> Neil, everybody, everybody went all just like, oh shit, we don't have a deal anymore. We're gonna get these car payments, house payments, I get you know whatever, and everyone just kind of. We never officially said, okay, we're breaking up. It was never like that. We're just like, oh, this, this sucks, and uh, okay, and and we just kind of went on to do uh, different different things. And um, yeah, that's that's we never officially said we're breaking up. It's I over. So, I so never want, like I that. so wanted kind of life like, went on. I so wanted you know Hardline Part Two of that debut album because that debut album was so good. And, and like I said, Thank as a you, fan man. back then, it was like yeah, I love this. And then you're just like, wait a second, I remembered liking this band called Hardline. Where did they go? You know, it was just one of those things <laughs> where right. all of a sudden, like you said. Tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, everybody stopped talking about you. It's crazy, man. And I remember my daughter, she was young, and she yelled down the stairs. She goes, Dad, you're on VH1 Classics. <laughs> and she said, Classics. <laughs> and I said, Go to your room. Go to your room, uh, man. So <laughs> that, video, that video put two sets of braces on your teeth. Go to your room. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> um, I got a question. 
for all sure. of us that are not musicians and will never achieve, achieve the success you've had, when you look back at that, one of those first shows with Van Halen and you're in Hardline, was playing in front of a large audience everything you had hoped it would be? And if you can put it into words, could you share with our listeners what that feeling is like? Oh, man, that is that's I don't know that I can put it in words. I'm going to try. OK, um, orgasmic comes to mind. But let me just put it this way. So there is such a level of first for me gratitude when those lights go off and you hear that roar and that roar is for you that is the vitals in your body that is what is pumping your heart delivering blood to your anatomy it is the most incredible feeling of gratefulness and i'll never forget telling my my wife who was my girlfriend at the time every day we wake up we have to be grateful that we're in this position and we have lived by that to this day it's a feeling you guys that you just you can't explain with words it is a rush it is i wait for it and that was my fear my biggest fear was not hearing that ever again in my life and it's funny because, you know, like, the first show was with Van Halen, Palace Auburn Hills. I think it's like a 50,000-seater. And I yeah. asked Alex uh, – asked, Alex was really into health at the time. We used to share juicing recipes. We'd have, like, a 100 pounds of carrots, and we'd, like, be juicing for the crew and shit. We were That's weird. so I, not rock and roll. I, him, I know, dude. That is so not rock and roll. So oxymoron rock <laughs> stuff. Like, would you like some juice? Would you like apple in it? I mean, it's terrible. But anyway, I would ask – um, Alex, I say, Alex, when you walk into here, into this place, do you still say, holy shit, look at these seats? And sadly, he said, no, man, it's just another show. Because he's just so, it just became so normal. Like, it didn't look big to him anymore because every right. show of his life was like that, right? But for me, I still look at that and I, to this day, and I'm 30 plus years in the business, right? I still look and go, holy shit, look at this, look at these people. And so I don't care if I'm sick, if I'm not in tip top shape at the time, or I got a headache, or I got a testicle ache, whatever the hell. I try to give those people everything I possibly can at every show because they deserve it. They paid for it. They're there for me. They built my career. So when you see all those seats and you hear that roar, I'm grateful, man. So I don't know if I answered the question. It is a feeling like no other. It's a feeling like no other. No, I think you did a great job because it, it, it's like that. That's why it's it, it's interesting that you bring up that the contrast with, say, Alex Van Halen, because in in the mind, I think of a lot of our listeners, mine included, is you think, OK, for all of the bad things about being in a band, like you said, you live with them, you're married to everybody. How can that ever overwhelm or overtake that feeling of playing for people, especially with a long career where they sing every word. And this is something that you may yeah. have out writing in your bedroom. That's exactly right, man. And you know, it, it yeah, it, it's true. And, you know, and the work within the business was just that it was work. But when we got on stage, people think that's when the work began for us. Uh, uh That's when the, when all the pleasure happens performing that was it the first chord actually the, the sound of the people the lights going out that sound and knowing that we're going to go out there and we're going to make music and we're going to make people happy we're going to make people happy man yeah. that is the coolest coolest feeling ever and then everything else was work but on stage was was it's just sheer freaking bliss so after i can't wait after things ended with hardline um, did you stay in touch with Neil? Was there ever talk of trying to put something else together, work together? 
No, not really. So, you know, when something traumatic like that happens in your life, you need some time. And I, I honestly, I took some time. I, I uh, short of therapy, when you lose a, a record deal of that magnitude, it scares the hell out of you as to what's next. So I sure. took a bunch of years and um, did some other things, some other business. My brother and I started this business that became very, very successful in California, and he still operates this business today. And um, so we did other things. I just needed a break from it. You know, I needed to come down from all of that. That was a lot of work. That was my, uh, you know, that was my lifeblood in that in that band. And it's just like it, it's almost like losing someone, God forbid, in an accident. You know, that was an accident, and and I had to recover from from that loss. And I did. I took the time, and it wasn't. Uh, until Serafino, the owner of Frontiers Records, sent me an email. He said, we need your voice. And I said, for what? <laughs> I thought he wanted me for a TV commercial or something. He goes, no, you can't stop singing. And I said, what are you talking about, man? No, I, I don't want He goes, I want another record. You got to do a record. I said, no. He goes, I'll give you this much money. I said, it's not about the money. No. And then he said, I'll give you this much money. He goes, no, it's not about the money. I don't give a shit what you offer. I'm not ready. I'll let you know. If I, if I change my mind and then, you know, a few months later, he'd write again, come on, man, the world needs your voice. You got to sing. He's a massive fan. I love him, Serafino Perugino, no, another pasta dish, but he, uh, <laughs> he's the one who forced me, sort of forced me back in. And I'm grateful to him as well, because it, it, it put me back on track with making hardline records. And then I uh, got in touch with uh, Axel, got in touch with me and making Axel records, which is just a complete blast from the past you know that metal music album that's what i was i was raised on that stuff you know listening mm -hmm. to rainbow and sabbath and dio and so it comes easy to me and i enjoy it and the fans enjoy it and so if they're happy i'm happy you know it's cool so but yeah so so i was gonna say you've got a you've got a solo album that's that's coming out now the first single is out now um talk yes. about that how how is how is Johnny's solo album different than Hardline, different than Brunette. Yeah, so it's completely different, but not. And I'll explain. So, you know, I've always been a band guy. If you followed my career, I've always been in, in bands. I never, I'm not a selfish guy. I'm, I'm, anyone who knows me knows I'm very mm -hmm. humble. And I never thought about doing a solo record ever until this young man in my hometown um, had a very, very tragic accident rendering him paralyzed. His name is Joe Barber. And, you know, there's, there's a million charities that we can donate to and support. I mean, millions of them. Right. But when something happens in your hometown, it's quite um, compelling to, you know, want to do something to help. I mean, it's shocking. So I said, you know, I, I said to myself, what can I do? Everyone's cutting the kid checks, and that's cool. We have to financially support. It's very expensive. All this rehabilitation, et cetera. But I wanted to do something more. I wanted to do something more. And I woke up one morning, and I said, I'm going to do a solo album. I'm going to dedicate it to this young man, and I'm going to involve humanity to help me financially fund this kid so i talked to the record company about doing the, the solo record uh which serafino wanted to do anyway but i said okay i don't want to just do a solo record because i don't give a shit about being solo here look at me i'm johnny gioelli look at me i don't care about that stuff i want to do it for a cause for a reason and serafino goes whatever you want to do man and i said this young man is paralyzed it cost spinal cord injuries in a lifetime of someone with paralysis over eight million dollars just to get through life Jesus we gotta help this God. kid yeah man so i contacted this, this this platform called pledge music yep um and yep. and and the outpouring we are 220 something percent of our goal fans from around this globe who don't even know this kid donated through their love of music and their love of humanity. And it has been the most life changing record for me. Um, and, and so the songs within this album are all very positive. 
you know, like the song Drive, which was released, I wrote that because I missed the days of cranking up the music in the car and going. Yep. Remember those yep. days, man? You yep. would just crank the shit. You would just go. I had no idea. Like in California, I would like drive to the beach because why not? And you would crank the tunes and that feeling I remember. And that's the, you know, that's sort of the, the whole threshold of that, of that song. But my goal was to support a great kid, a great family, help him financially and get, um, the world involved and I'll, and I'll and stop me when you want, but I'll, I'll sidebar a little bit. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the fans and about the world. I go everywhere. I'm leaving for Bulgaria this week. I'll be in Bulgaria, I'll be in Italy, I'll be in Czech Republic. I'll be all over the place. And those, the, the people, you know, sometimes we get caught up a little too much in what we read and what we see on TV about the rest of the world. This world is filled with some of the greatest humans ever. And I'll give you a little really cool story. I'll never forget when my son came to me and goes, he was young at the time. He's, he's now 14. He was, he was very young. And he goes, Dad, why don't we just drop a bomb on Iran? And I said, son, come here. I want you to read something. And it was a letter, an email actually from a, a young brother and sister from Iran who said, your music lifts us. It makes us alive. It makes us feel amazing in, a to- in, in an area that is so unsafe and so uncertain. You bring us life. And I said to my son, I said to him, you want, I get emotional thinking about it. Take your time. You want to, you want to drop a bomb on them? It's crazy. Yeah. 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 And he he goes, sorry, Dad. I didn't. Sorry, Dad. But and what a cool, it is, it's emotional. It's a it moment, though. You know, seriously. Amazing, amazing. And I'm telling you guys, there are fans and people from around this world that donated to this this gentleman. Uh, they don't know him, just because humanity is good. And I, I have a, a press kit on YouTube right now explaining, you know, one voice, and and you can see Joe Barber in this uh, YouTube video. You just put in. You know, Johnny Gioelli, One Voice, and everything will will pop in. And that's why I titled the album One Voice, because together, um, it's true, man. We are so strong in numbers. And, and this whole world came together. It's just such a, a testament to how great people are. So that's the, the whole thrust behind uh, the record. We've got some great excitement from very, very big morning television that we're getting ready to, uh, to to fire off. I think it's going to be a very successful record, and I couldn't be happier to make it charitable. So, why, that's, John, that's Johnny, why voice. why didn't you do it under the Hardline name? Well, it's, it doesn't sound like Hardline to me. I classify it as again. I wrote this record for me. Uh, like a painter would make a painting. He's not going to like, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to see what Mike and Tommy want. I mean, if I draw this beautiful beach scene, I think Mike and Tommy are going to buy it. I, I painted a picture that I wanted to paint and, uh, and did that musically. And to me, it sounds like, you know, people always comment on what they think it sounds like. And that's great. You know, they're entitled, they're entitled to their opinion. I think it's very, Brian Adams meets Foo Fighters. To me, that's what when I listen okay. to my own record, cool. okay. I like it. it. It it feels past but current. Um, it's just it's. I can't wait for its release. It's released on uh, December seventh on Frontiers label. Um, Pledge Music is still intact. If anyone wants to check out, you know what we you know join Pledge Music and donate. It's pledgemusic.com slash Johnny Gioelli so they can still donate to the to to Joe um, that's always welcome and receive some you know cool cool we call them exclusives they're like gifts you know for, in awesome. doing so but um yeah so it's not a hardline record it to me it doesn't sound uh, at all like hardline there's not uh, there's no hardline musicians on it although Alessandro Del Vecchio did produce it uh, for me and, and engineer it it doesn't sound like a, like a hardline record at all well John, Johnny this has been an, an, an amazing chat and and unfortunately yeah. we do have we this do is, have to wrap yeah. but 
I think you're no you're you're a big enough Kiss fan, and being <laughs> being part of yes, the music sir. industry, you're you 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 were probably around during all of this. So I'm going to throw a question yes. that we 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 surprise some of our guests with. Did okay. I'm horrible with questions? Okay, but okay. Did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? Oh Lord, I have to answer this, huh? <laughs> uh, okay, wait. I'm entitled to my opinion. No, you right? are. One hundred percent. Whatever your opinion is, you know, we'll ask you why. Once you say yes or no, we'll ask you why. But it, we're fine with whatever your opinion is. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me think about it. No. So the the short answer is: Did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? The short answer is absolutely. No, not at all. Um, I I didn't feel anything new and exciting when when Vinny uh, joined. I thought it was a little weird. And uh, no, I mean I'm still I still live in the the Kiss seventies, you know, time, and so. Um, I don't think there was any saving uh, that needed to be done. Their kiss, they have nothing, to, like especially for me, they have nothing to prove. They're epic. They right. could come out with, with any music using any musician. They still kiss um, to me. You know what yep. I mean? So, yep. um, well, you know, no. because because and, you're because uh, no. you're a big enough fan, and you you basically said you still live for like the kiss of the seventies. What's your what's your opinion of what Kiss is doing putting putting Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer in Ace and Peter's makeup? Uh yeah, you know that's a little it's a little weird. Um but I, I get it. I get that they're you know just trying to recreate those, you know, beginnings and allowing people uh, the opportunity who didn't see them back then to at least get a feel for it. So, you know, in that respect, it's, it's okay. But, you know, look, just like the original journey and current journey, it's just not the same. It's because it isn't, you know what I mean? Does it make it wrong? Uh, no, uh, it doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it different. And the same thing with hardline. Neil Sean's not in hardline anymore. Does it make it wrong? No, it just makes it, it makes it different. So, no, that's I mean that's could, reasonable. It is. It's different. Could you could you have seen your, could you have seen yourself replacing Steve Perry in Journey? Hell yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> never. <laughs> never. No, never. You know what's so funny because everyone comes to me and says y everyone family and friends you could do that job. You could sing those songs. And I'd said immediately, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No one can sing those songs but Steve Perry. There might be people who sound like them, people who can emulate, do it, but no way, speaking for myself, would I want to fill those shoes. Hell no. No way. I do what I do. It's what I do. Nice. Take it or leave it. What, 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 what's your personal thoughts on finally new music from Steve Perry after all these years? Man, you know, I've I've known Steve for for a long time, and um, you know, he used to is he used to go over to my uh, sister's house in California. We'd all meet, and you know, we'd cook Italian sauce, you know, Sunday sauce, and he would go down the slide on her pool, and uh, you know, we you know shared a lot of fun times and stuff. And I remember uh, he's a great guy. I remember coming up. Uh, I was this is before Neil. He was recording a solo album. He's recorded many of them that got rejected. I don't know why, because they were brilliant. But he's recorded so many. And I remember him calling. We told him, he's Steve, we met him for the first time in a recording studio in, in L.A. We said, Steve, my mother's a huge fan. He goes, oh, cool, let's call her. And he spoke to my mom for nearly an hour. Let me tell you something. If I'm in the recording studio and I have to sing, I'm not talking to anybody's mother for an hour. Right. So he was, right. He was, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just a little trying on the voice. You just want to be cool. And he was so gracious and wonderful. And then I got to know him. It's just such a, how, how things work in life. You know, I, we're huge, 
Journey fans, huge Steve Perry fan, meet him. And the next thing you know, we're like stirring us off together on Sunday. Um, I'm happy for him to answer your question. If this is what he wants to do and he loves it and he, and he loves the music that he's made and he's proud of it and he's got a story to tell, God bless him, man. Why not? Why not? And, but I will tell you guys this. There are – I, I want to know the day that I don't sound like myself, I want someone to tell me and then I'm going to stop. There's so many musicians out there that just don't sound like they did, but try to. It's so freaking annoying when you don't sound like you anymore. You, you got to stop. So please guys, Mike, Tommy, when I don't sound like me, please tell me and I'm going to, I'm going to retire. You. We'll call you. Yeah, give me exactly. Yeah, we'll play this for you. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play the, we're gonna play this recording to you and go. Listen, this is what you said. Get the f yeah. off stage, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect, man. That's perfect. Uh, perfect. That it'll be sneaking up to take another shot. Yeah. You know? uh, Johnny, where 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 can people find you online? Oh, brother, everywhere. So every single music platform that plays mu music the itunes spotify apple music all that stuff where you can buy music and listen to music all of my works all of my albums are on those platforms um so uh and, and then whatever remaining <laughs> stores that are left in this world you could of course buy the albums buy the cds they're, they're, we're, we're making a lot of vinyl now which is so cool that that's kind of coming back yep. you know yep so uh yeah, it, it's out there. It's out there on every single digital platform known to man. You can buy a Hardline or an Axel Rudy Pell or a Crush 40 or a Johnny G.O.L.E. solo album. Uh, what, 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 what about websites for you? Uh, so HardlineRocks.com is for Hardline. And uh, and then I still encourage everyone to go to, to, to PledgeMusic.com slash Johnny G.O.L.E. And uh, take a look at what we're doing there for for uh, this young man, Joe, um, Joe Barber, who's just an amazing kid now in college and just pushing through. Um, I mean, he texts with his mouth. I mean, it's just it's amazing. So um, I, I just I welcome everyone to go to that site, uh, pledgemusic.com slash Johnny G. Well, and just just look at what we've we've done for this kid and and participate. You know, you, you don't have to spend the bundle. Uh, Ten bucks helps. Like you have no idea. Um, so you can go to that site and then Axel's site. Who the hell knows what that site is? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Google, man. Google. So, yeah, Axel's site. So we've got tours coming up. I've got hardline tours in Europe. I have uh, Axel Rudy Pell tours. And then I'm also really grateful that I'm part of the Bonfire Legends tour, which is happening in Europe in November. So um, I'm, I'm playing with like Jeff Tate. Queensryche and a bunch of great singers and we're doing all these all this you know this massive show and you know, tribute songs uh, all together that's happening in uh, November and then back out on the road in December and January with Hardline and so it's just it's a busy wonderful grateful life man awesome that's fantastic awesome well good for good you for man yep. living the life yeah thanks for man. sure thank you uh so thanks man. so, I so I appreciate you i appreciate you guys you guys keep it alive like i like i said without the fans without guys like you really seriously what the hell are we we're just like i'm just a voice that would never get heard never right? so that's well, why i live my my life uh extremely grateful uh, and you know well, thank you guys fascinating and thank thank you for sharing your story thank you for you know filling in a few more kiss pieces of history for all of the kiss fans who want all that little minutia that that surrounds this band and you know best of luck to you and and, and your solo man. release Johnny. thank you bro thank you so much i'm so grateful that my mother my mother did not uh kill paul stanley that would have been <laughs> we all are very very bad <laughs> we yeah that would have been very bad <laughs> she came back she goes Oh, I feel really bad. I tripped him with her New York accent. Tripped him. You tripped Paul Stanley. Yes, he, he he caught himself, but he was carrying a guitar and he almost ate it. I'm like, oh my god, oh, mom, for God's sake, you must kill Paul Stanley. Uh, <laughs> with that, with well, that, I thank you guys so much. It was so great talking to you it guys was a pleasure, and to all the Kiss Johnny. fans listening. God bless you guys because you guys 
make all of this happen. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks so much. Take care, man. Uh, man, it. that that was such a fun interview. Johnny is such an amazing, fun person to talk to. Great stories. Yeah. Well, and what made it even better is Chikini's not here. Well, exactly. We didn't have you to know? listen to him go fanboy. Exactly. He's probably in a food coma right now on a plane. Well, fr- frankly, Chikini probably would have gone fanboy over like Italian recipes with Johnny. Meatloaf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> meatloaf. We talked about meatloaf, ketchup, and red sauce. I don't Ex- know. Exactly. Oh, Parmesan yeah, cheese. Just... Have you ever tried Parmesan cheese on shrimp? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> shrimp salad. Coconut shrimp. Yeah, I, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect going into this one because I didn't know much about the background, although I know the Hardline album. And he was just really fascinating and, and really fun to listen to. He had great stories. Yeah. So I hope all out there that are listening or watching enjoyed it as much as we did great kiss stories great journey steve perry neil sean um music business just yeah all 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 sorts of good stories so yeah i i hope you guys enjoyed it i had a blast with this one um i was definitely a, a hardline fan that first album if you haven't if you haven't listened to it head over to spotify look for hardline um double eclipse it came out in 92 i believe um just a great album just a great album uh homework homework what would you have done if your mom killed paul stanley <laughs> oh well yeah that's that that would be yeah, that's about, yeah. Can you imagine? It would have been ugly. Yeah. I mean, that gives you a place in history for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would. Yeah, and, and, you know, check out the music. Check out Hardline, like Michael was saying, and also support him and maybe check, make a donation yeah. if you can spare a few bucks. And Check out his, check out his uh, solo, solo album, the first track is has been released and you can find that on spotify so yeah let us know what do you think of johnny's solo track what do you think of of hardline um yeah and you know what would you have done if your mom killed paul stanley yeah i i'd say that that's those are all really good uh good options for people today so there you go you know where to go to leave your homework facebook.com slash three sides of the coin our website youtube spreaker every place you can find us leave comments and uh that's it i think mark is actually back next week but i don't really give a shit uh, shoot is he really i don't know I don't oh know. hey i almost oh. forgot don't want to forget this that's is my buddy Kyle. Kyle. okay kyle loves we want to keep Kyle hammered the whole time he's on the boat. He loves so, beer and he Kyle, loves nothing more than sitting at a bar talking to Kiss fans for hours on end. Yes, and the more he drinks, the better the stories get. So he loves he loves beer and he loves shots of Jack Daniels. So if you see him on the ship, let's keep Kyle hammered. And 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 you know what? Play the is this a dick game with him. Yeah, but we how can we do that? Because Will needs to be there to tell us if indeed it really is a dick or not. Well, true. It's always more fun with Will there, but it's still a fun game to play. Just just walk just no, just really... walk up just walk up to Kyle if you see him on the ship and go, Hey, is this a dick? That would be a funny bit actually to do with Will. Is it a dick or is it not? <laughs> Oh, all right, let's wrap uh, all right. this up. That, that's it. We're out of here till next week. Three sides of the coin. See you, dudes. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Take Three Sides of the Coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com.
Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.